Here at Freedom House, we are very proud partners with the Myanmar ICT for Development organization, and we wanted to congratulate Mido on putting together this groundbreaking multi-stakeholder forum to advocate and advance internet freedom in Myanmar. We first learned about this forum when Mido submitted the winning idea to the IGF challenge. Uh, it was an incubator project that Freedom House hosted, and we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. So here with me now are Danilo Bakovic, he's the director for our Internet Freedom Program, and to my left is Isabel Rutherford, she's instrumental to our Southeast Asia program work, and we're going to hear from both of them right now. Thanks guys for joining me. So first Danilo, you were one of the judges on the panel that chose Mito to be awarded the funding for this initiative. Uh, what was it that impressed the judges? First of all, it was an extremely difficult task. There was a seven finalists and all of them were uh, extraordinary. And uh, Mido was one of them and their project proposal was really, really good. Uh, the idea was excellent. It was the only idea that basically, uh, 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 you know, initiated or asked for organizing an interfilm forum as a, as, as, as a first multi-stakeholder forum in Burma. And uh, I say, you know, uh, Mido scored the number one place. And we are very happy and glad to see this, uh, you know, now happening. We are very proud and glad that the Mido participated last year in November in 2012 in Azerbaijan, and they very well represented Myanmar. And we are looking forward for the more uh, stakeholders from Burma being present on the global and on the regional uh, events. Uh, moving now over to Isabel, your team has been very active in championing human rights in Myanmar, Burma. So we're very interested to hear from you. First, tell me about your take on the rapid changes that we hear about happening in that country. Uh, is civil society benefiting from this change and how have ICT tools helped? Um, Burma is actually a country that has benefited from a very vibrant civil society. The changes have enabled civil society actors to operate in a more open and transparent manner but there's still a long way to go, and um, ICT tools will hopefully increasingly benefit these groups who are continuing to push for further democratic changes and engaging more um, voices across Burma into the conversation. Specifically, I think ICT tools will hopefully expand the conversation to talk about issues that still need reform, um, incorporate uh, the voices of people across Burma, including the ethnic groups, into the conversation and be a way for people to share information and education about what's happening in other parts of the world. Very interesting. So you mentioned some of the issues that still need reform, um, and no doubt there will be lots of discussion about this at the forum, uh, but can you go into more detail about what are the top issues that you would like to see discussed and uh, hopefully resolved using these ICT tools? Certainly. Um, I think that one of the, the three challenges that are, well there are many, the top three I would say, are figuring out a way to better incorporate the many minority groups in Burma into the democratic conversation, um, specifically with the Rohingya and other um, minority states. Um, secondly, I would say that the laws still have a long way to go. Um, they should be reformed or an, an old laws that are undemocratic or otherwise antiquated will be addressed and hopefully ICT tools will help that conversation around that. And finally, I'd say that um, increased transparency and accountability will be a big area that um, a bright future for Burma will hope to address. Uh, Danilo, back to you. Over the past year, you've been watching the variety of threats to online security around the world. And we know it's every internet and mobile user's responsibility to educate themselves about digital hygiene and security. Uh, but what do you recommend specifically for users in Burma to protect themselves against the variety of cyber crime and digital attacks? Uh, do you have any recommendations about where they can turn? Gigi, you were absolutely right. I think that the self-education is the most important part in, in you know, countering the digital threats that we as uh, internet users might encounter. Um, and there is a plenty of resources online uh, that people can access and maybe educate themselves about the different threats 
that they're exposed to uh, online. Uh, I would say, I mean, organizations like Mido uh, are definitely the good resource for that, and I don't want to overburden them, but definitely, um, you know, um, uh, they would be a, a good place to go as a, as a resource. International organizations like Freedom House uh, or some other organizations can be a good resource uh, for providing uh, maybe some specialized trainings uh, in a sense of digital security and secure communications. We're going to actually turn now to our New York office via Skype, where Madeline Earp is waiting to talk with us. And Madeline is a research analyst for Freedom House's Freedom on the Net report, which has rated Burma not free in 2011 and 2012 editions of the report. The 2013 report is due out this fall, and it will again cover key developments in the country. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Gigi. We are obviously watching a very dynamic situation in Burma right now and a lot of restrictions on, particularly on content, have been lifted in the past year. So that's very positive. What's less positive is that we're still looking at a underdeveloped telecommunications sector and that is providing a lot of challenges for average internet users to get online. It's still prohibitively expensive and there are a lot of remnants of uh, fear and intimidation in the online culture which are not promoting free online speech. One concern that we have based on what we've seen in the past year is that while those restrictions are gone people are stepping into this new much freer space and sharing a lot of aggressive hate speech particularly against ethnic minority groups and so that's something that is going to continue unless we see some very strict self-regulation policies put in place by uh, online news providers and bloggers as well as uh, codes of conduct which prevent people in state positions from using online media as a sort of platform to launch their personal uh, prejudices. Uh, that's been uh, a real concern in the, in the past year and it would be a very, very negative trend going forward if that were to continue. I think a really critical question is to do with legislation. Now, Burma is waiting for the government to enact a new telecommunications law which would really free up the market for foreign service providers to come in and provide more affordable services for people to access the internet uh, either uh, through computer or through their mobile phone. Uh, in the meantime, very repressive laws which uh, threaten internet users with very punitive consequences for online speech remain in place. I'm thinking in particular of the electronic transaction laws. These were used against the kinds of dissidents and bloggers who were imprisoned in Burma uh, in the past sort of decade or so. Now we do believe most of them have been released, but what my colleagues tell me is that the charges facing them have not been dropped. So not only do they risk going back to prison, the laws that were used to imprison them are still in place and could be used against anyone at any time. So on the one hand, we'll be waiting for the government to speed up its legislative reform, its promise to privatize the industry, to undo the existing state monopoly. On the other hand, we're really looking for them to correct the laws that are in place to punish people who express themselves online. Those are two things that are critical in the, in the coming year. In your view, Madeline, how can internet freedom advocates and everyday ICT users in Burma ensure that these reforms trickle down to the people? I think what's interesting about the situation in Burma right now is that the government is demonstrating that it is able to reduce these prohibitive prices, which even in the region are just extraordinarily expensive. Uh, just to buy a SIM card or to install private internet access, it's extraordinarily costly right now. But the government has said that it will reduce the costs for foreign visitors coming in, for example, uh, for the Southeast Asian Games in 
December 2013. So it clearly has the capacity to change this situation, but it's been reluctant to do so. So the question I think internet users should be asking themselves is why is it taking so long and who stands to benefit from the status quo? And the answer unfortunately is the people, the regulators, the government officials and the people in charge of the telecommunications, uh, which at the moment is heavily dominated by the state. And we saw in January this year uh, some very serious corruption allegations against the information minister. Okay, so there is an important conversation around anonymity and privacy in relation to internet freedom. When these rights aren't safeguarded, the chilling effect leads to a climate of self-censorship, especially in marginalized groups and dissident uh, voices. How can stakeholders promote and protect anonymity and privacy with respect to communications to ensure a really robust dialogue that leads to a plurality of voices and democratic advancement? I would say that it's very important for internet users to educate themselves about who is storing their information, how it might be used, and who is entitled to request it, uh, for what purpose. So there are many countries uh, in Asia that were looking at a growing trend of intermediaries, which is to say the companies who are responsible for providing services or providing online platforms for people to blog or to use their mobile phone. They are increasingly being co-opted by repressive authorities who require them to store data or monitor users as a condition of operation. So this is something that is a trend in other Southeast Asian countries and I think that by cooperating with other civil society groups and other internet users in the region, uh, internet users in Burma will be able to follow these trends and make sure that they're not uh, dealing with companies who have this in mind and that they're not allowing laws to be passed which would perpetuate that kind of risk towards their, their identity and the, the information that they're exchanging. Uh, now, given the low internet penetration rate in Burma, can you tell us a little bit about the key factors that are limiting citizens' internet access and usage? I think the principal factor in the past year has been the high cost of getting online, but there's also a lot of just purely physical challenges uh, in Burma, just in terms of getting the infrastructure in place. And that's something that, that's common to uh, some other countries in the region, but they are gradually overcoming it, mostly due to some very aggressive state policies. States are recognizing that it's essential to strengthen the infrastructure uh, and that's partly because of user demand. So this is something that Burmese internet users can do to ensure that the government recognizes this is a key issue going forward. And that will, uh, you know, by attracting state attention, by attracting international attention, by attracting hopefully economic uh, investment in the sector, that will help overcome just some of the kind of severe practical challenges in getting some of these signals into rural areas. Can I also ask you to say something about the ban on voice over IP tools? I think that the voice over IP is an issue because it's been seen as a, as a potential competitor to the telecommunications companies, which, as I mentioned before, are very, uh, at the moment, have too much too entwined with the state. So the state sees voice over IP as being something that's going to undermine their own profits. So separating the issue first of all, by under, undoing the state monopoly on the industry and recognizing that voice over IP is providing people with some really essential tools for development uh, is going to mean that that is not sustainable. Uh, we don't see those, those kinds of blocks in many other Asian countries um, unless you're talking about somewhere like China, which is much, much more heavily repressive than, than Burma should be uh, in the coming year. Okay, wrapping up now, uh, we just want to thank everyone, and I, of course I want to thank my colleagues who joined me here, Danilo and Isabel and Madeline in New York, and our good friend Karen who's behind the camera. Uh, everybody really pitched in to send this message to you because we, again, really wish we could have been there, and we'll definitely see you next year live in person uh, for the second annual uh, Myanmar Internet Freedom Forum.